I live in a small village in uh, rural North Wales. I've been working in ceramics now for almost exactly 40 years. Uh, throughout my whole working life I've been not only a maker but I've also been a teacher as well of ceramics, working initially in the um, School of Art and Design in Wrexham in North Wales and then um, the rest of the time, 30, nearly 30 years, been working at the University of Central Lancashire in Preston. The work that I'm making now, really I use two main clay bodies. There's a sort of fine textured stoneware clay and there is a porcelain, uh, a grog porcelain that I use. Um, I do sometimes blend the two together if I want somewhere, you know, mixed between the two. But I also adapt the, well, either clay really with um, a lot of granular material for certain pieces because it gives me a different sort of quality, different effect with the glazes. So I use a, a granular felspar, which is a felspathic material that is normally milled down to make a glaze, you know, felspar glaze material. Uh, but I use it in a, a granular state, anything up to about three or four mil in size. I use um, coarse textured molochite that I add and cord all sorts of granular materials. And I add those to the, either the stoneware or the, the um, the porcelain, wedging them in in varying proportions and that alters quite dramatically how the glaze works on the form. So I make a large lump of clay depending on the size and configuration of the form that I want to make. And then I have a whole array of different wooden sticks that I will push into the lump of clay. So I will form the lump of clay and then um, select a, a wooden stick to sort of push down into the clay to create the void, the, the, the vessel sort of part of it. And then the clay is, is sort of shaped and formed around that. It's sometimes because obviously when you push a stick into a piece of clay, it displaces the clay. So I have to reconfigure and, and control the, the clay back into a, a reasonable shape. And then that's allowed to dry um, with a stick in it. The, the state of dryness is absolutely crucial to my work. Um, when I get to cut it and carve it later on, if it's not at the right dryness, if it's too wet, it doesn't cut right, if it's too dry, it scratches. And so that is a critical, critical um, aspect of my work in a way. Right? I then withdraw the, the wooden stick from it to create that creates the, the basic sort of void. I then um, bring into play all the, the, the tools. I, the tool I use most is a very sharp blade, a very firm, thick blade from a, plane, a wood plane, a thickson machine that allows to give me these lovely cuts that I get. So I will shape up the block basically to a basic geometric block to start with. Um, and then I will refine the, the hole inside. So that might involve working with wood chisels. I tend to mark it with a scalpel um, and then cut back just like you would with wood really. You, you cut back to the line to create a, a crisp sort of interior to the, the piece. And then I um, start work on the outside, and it, it's a very sort of intuitive process, really. You know, I I know roughly what I want to get, but but the cut will go so far, and then I feel that's enough, or it'll possibly slip a little bit, or it, you know, I, I I I know to a point what I'm going to get, but there's always that sort of chance element, which I quite like, because that's a mix of chance of of um, control and chance in a way, really. In essence, I have one glaze recipe. Um, that, you know, there's a whole array of different effects, but the base glaze is, an, is, is just one recipe. But what changes it most of all is the body that it sits on. So when it's on the smooth textured stoneware, it gives one effect. When it's on the porcelain, you get a much brighter, cleaner sort of quality to it. And when it's on the the body that's got the the granular felspar and the texture or the textural material, you get a much much more sort of reactive surface because this felspar melts at high temperature. I fire my work to nearly 1320 so it's very high temperature for electric kiln fired but you do get that real interaction between the, the glaze and the clay body 
which is really important to me. And that shows, I think, in the work, the fact that you get this huge variation in effect from just essentially one glaze. Um, small pieces I will just dip. They're just literally glazing tongs into a bucket and larger pieces I will spray. So I'll, I'll pour the glaze on the inside, um, tip out, clean it back, and then I'll spray, build up the thickness of glaze. And they do, I do find I need quite a thick application of glaze. It does help, that helps give the richness of the, of the quality of the glaze when it's actually fired. And then um, fired in electric kiln, I have to wad them on, I use wadding like you would use in a salt kiln or a wood kiln, a mix of um, flour, kaolin and alumina, a refractory sort of wadding material that I wad and then place them carefully on that because the glaze can run quite a lot at the temperatures I fire to and the thickness they're applied at. The Japanese aesthetics has always been a sort of um, an underpinning of my art practice in a way, in a subtle sort of way, but there are three principles of Japanese sort of aesthetics that for me are really, really important. Shibui, Shinzen and Fukinsai. Shibui in particular is about this idea of this sort of unobtrusive beauty and quietness. And I, I've, I've sort of drawn to that concept in a way. I, I know I'd like my piece to stand quietly. I don't want it to shout and be loud. Shinzen is all about being in harmony with nature. It's about this idea of um, human interaction with nature. And the classic situation is, is you know, the Zen garden where we look at the beauty of, the, of the, uh, the nature, but actually we're also looking at the creative energy and ideas of the gardener and the designer of the garden as well. So it's the two things. It's about harmonizing with nature, but also creativity within that, within that principle. And then for Kensai, is about this idea of asymmetry, of admiration of asymmetry and irregularity and the balance and imbalance, the harmony between the two. And all those three principles seem to be wrapped up together or something, I don't know whether they inform my work or I just feel a connection with it, but they, there's, there's something about those that sort of resonate with my, with my practice.